Christine retired in Mexico, and let me make sure that my mic sometimes doesn't pick up the first word. It's Jean retired in Mexico, and if it's your first time to the channel, we ask one question here, which is, do they write them and sing them like they used to? Now, a lot of, I say this all the time, a lot of people, young and old, it doesn't matter, all ages, they, they think the old music is better, but I am not so sure. I'm a defender of the 21st century. So today uh, is uh, the continued countdown of 30 best, top, favorite, whatever you want to call my subjective 30 favorite albums of uh, 2007. And we're doing number 20 through 11. So we're right in the middle, part two. I really enjoy doing these. Uh, they're not quite as popular as the reaction videos, but I think this is cool to go through these. And if you look at the best sellers from this year, uh, the Alicia Keys and Josh Groban and the different people that, Beyonce and the different people that were being uh, purchased, uh, this is um, this list is very anti the best selling stuff. So. Uh, I think this is what's cool. I think you guys will largely agree with me on the titles that you know, the ones that you don't know. Maybe you'll check them out. I have a Spotify playlist I'll put below in the link. You can check that out if you want to do a further dive. So let's get right into it. And do hit that like or subscribe button if you like what I'm doing. Senior, react, senior reacting to the new music of the 21st century. Not many people doing this on YouTube. So... Uh, yeah, most people do not hit the like button or subscribe. It's probably less than 10%. So, so uh, yeah, don't be in the my don't be in the majority. Be special. Be in the minority. All right, number 20 is from a veteran uh, that goes all the way back to the 1960s. Someone I've seen two times in concert. Often makes uh, the. Uh, 100 Greatest Guitarist Lists, he often shows up on that. Richard Thompson, who was in Fairport Convention, then in a duo with his wife, former wife, Richard and Linda Thompson, and then in the 80s, he started a solo career. This is now this is now called Sweet Warrior, and he's put out a bunch of albums, but Richard Thompson, if you don't know him, it's criminal how how he's not more popular I, I i'm just baffled by it in fact a lot of people are baffled by it not just me uh so anyway there was one pretty big hit i guess you could say if you want to call it a hit it's a song called dad's gonna kill me and you know i think it was used in it was used in a uh, netflix series um i i don't know what that series was called i am um, thought about doing that song for a uh, Master Monday, and I got to tell you, that video was so violent. I'm like, you yeah, know, I can handle some violence, but I don't know, head injuries? I thought, I don't need that on my channel. I'm going to have to, um, you know, we do a little rating thing where we have to rate uh, our content, you know, to... I've already got it marked not for kids, but um, the more violent something is, the more I have to report that. So, yeah, I don't like to do that. But this is a real underrated gem with varied instrumentation. But Dad's going to kill me. Dad is short for Baghdad, and I didn't know that for a long time. So it's really Baghdad's going to kill me. Now, this is 2007, right? So we had the invasion of Iraq. George Bush was president, W. And uh, so, yeah, here we go. Uh, great song with wicked guitar. It's fast tempo. And then he turns around and he does a song like She Sang Angels to Rest, which is one of the prettiest love songs you'll ever hear. Very delicate, very pretty. So he's got quite the vocabulary. And if you listen to this album, he's got a lot of different genre styles on here. It's... Um, Four stars on, on all music. That's about what I would give it, around four stars. Uh, but pretty highly rated album. 84 on Metacritic uh, and the top 300 on Rate Your Music, which is which is good. And he's just, uh, you know, he's from England and he's this criminally underrated guitar player and singer. 
Most people know him for his song 1952 Vincent Black Lightning. So if you've heard that, that's Richard Thompson. All right, number 19 is a uh, offshoot or solo project, and I actually have a burned copy of this. My friend burned me the Grinder Man CD. You might see the monkey on the front there. Grinder Man is a Nick Cave side project, uh, along with, uh, I don't know, maybe Warren Ellis or Mick Harvey or one of those guys, but this is awesome. So they did two albums, and this is the first one, simply called Grinder Man. And I, I, I love it. It's full of humor. Uh, it's got, it's just the band. There's no guest musicians, so it's just them playing on all the songs. It sounds like it was recorded fairly re quickly because uh, it feels spontaneous, and there's tons of humor on here. Uh, so in my notes, I wrote that, you know, because Nick Cave's first band was The Birthday Party, which is a pretty extreme band, uh, you know, punk or almost anti-punk. I don't know what you want to call it. I mean, kind of in that public image limited uh, kind of thing where they're not doing them, they're not doing straight melodies. This is kind of a sweet spot between the birthday party and the bad seed. So uh, really funny songs on here. Um, track two is probably the funniest song on here. It's called, and I'm not making this up. It's called No Pussy Blues. Yeah. And uh, it's about a guy who can't get any. And he's doing all this stuff. He says, I even petted her revolting chihuahua, but she just didn't want to. So... <laughs> It's hilarious. You got depth charge Ethel. Uh, go tell the women that we're leaving. It's uh, got a lot of humor on it. It rocks really hard. I really recommend Grinder Man. Uh, got decent reviews. Uh, that's also a four star album on all your music, and, and I would agree with that. So, Grinder Man is, uh, I don't know, it's just a fun listen. Uh, yeah. Aggressive, hard-rocking music with humor. So if you like that kind of thing. Number 18 is an international album. And if you guys have followed me, you know I like international music. Uh, this is someone I have seen in concert. Uh, she opened for her father. This is Anushka Shankar with Karsh Kale. So she is a sitar player from India, though I believe she lives in California. Her father is Ravi Shankar, and I saw them on a double bill. It was awesome. And this particular album, who's Karsh Kale? Well, he's a guy who uh, does kind of ambient soundtrack and instrumental music, and he's a really good orchestrator. So he got together with her. She's a sitar player, and... He was responsible for the arrangements. Now, she did the writing, uh, and he helped. Uh, well, they co-wrote things, but she did a lot of the writing, but he's kind of the chief arranger. And then there's uh, guest musicians on here. Two of them are from India, one woman, one male. I love the, the songs that the uh, male singer sings especially. Uh, and then Sting is on here, and Nora Jones is on here. For those of you who don't know, Nora Jones is Anushka, Anushka, Anushka Shankar's half-sister. So they both have the same father, Ravi Shankar. And, uh, and so anyway, different mothers. But uh, she sings on here. Obviously, Nora Jones was huge in the 2000s. That's another artist that people were buying. Though, though I do like Nora Jones. I've got nothing um, against her. It's just her music's a little bit easy listening, but uh, yeah, that debut was pretty good. Um, anyway, the uh, male singer on here, he sings kind of, um, he reminds me of Pakistani singers, quality singers like Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan. He does this whole different style that that's not what I'm used to hearing from Indian music. It's great. There's a song on here called PD7. It includes a lot of electronics and experimental production. Uh, they're doing this thing where they 
I'm not sure what the right word is, but they do phasing and kind of collapsing of the sound. You know, when things go, Pink Floyd did a lot of that where they would do a really muffled sound and then all of a sudden it would be crystal clear. So there's all these experimental production sounds and it is really high tempo. It moves at a fast pace and she's just killing it on the sitar. So many good songs on here. I think the Sting song might actually be my least favorite. It's still a good one. And what I'll say in closing about this album called Breathing Underwater, that's the name of it, is you can listen to it passively as background music or you can really actively listen to it and it will reward you with either experience. So love it. Uh, four stars on all music and yeah, I would agree with that. All right, number 17, another four star album on all music is The White Stripes, Icky Thump. I like this album. Uh, some people are not keen on it, uh, but Pitchfork gave it an eight. Isn't that surprising? This has great variation. This is the album that has the bagpipe guitar on it, has that song called Conquest, which is very, remind you of bullfighting or matadors. And I like that. I like that uh, Jack White keeps the whole thing interesting on here. I like Icky Thump. It's, uh, I think they're second to the last, I believe it was their second to last album before they called it quits. And so the White Stripes didn't make enough albums really to get into a huge slump. I like everything they do. Title track is great on here. It didn't have as many hit singles, but it rewards. I like Icky Thump quite a bit. Let me know what you think about it. Number 16 is an album I think will surprise all of you, I think, especially if you follow the channel. You'd be like, really? He likes this album? Really? Gene, retired in Mexico, likes this album? I thought you weren't a Daft Punk fan. No, I'm not a big Daft Punk fan, but I do like Justice another duo from France and their album Cross, Thump and Crunch. That's my dis description of this. And I'm not sure if it's just an 808 thumping away or what kind of instrumentation they're using, but man, this hits so hard. I'd love to be on the dance floor with this. And then there's songs like D-A-N-C-E, which uh, I think that's the one's kind of a nod to Michael Jackson. There's kind of a, almost a children's choir on it. Really fun stuff, but my favorite track is Waters of Nazareth. That song, which, which is the single, it just hits so hard. I don't know how they do it. Uh, a lot of people try to crunch, you know, that sort of ACDC style crunch, but Justice just boom, they just crunch so hard. I love it. And the, uh, there's like, I don't know. It's just, this is a fun ride. So this is my alternative and my preference to Daft Punk. If I'm going to listen to French, uh, that kind of music, I'm going to listen to air or justice or something like that. Just my preference. Number 15, is an album that was huge in 2007. Really a big album, sold really well. And I think it's aged well. This is Feist, The Reminder. Do you remember that song, One, Two, Three, Four? It was a pretty big hit on the radio, back when radio still mattered. Uh, around 2007 is when radio would start to uh, shift and lose its influence. But So I think you had... Um, LimeWire and all those things happening, the beginning of streaming and downloads. But anyway, in 2007, I remember hearing Feist on the radio quite a bit. The opening track on here is really good too. I'm not looking at the track listing, but uh, several good songs. And, you know, I was thinking like, yeah, this can't be in my top 30. You know, it's probably going to sound so 2007. No, I've played this album two, three times uh, in preparation here. I think it's great. I think her songwriting is really powerful. Her voice is good. And 
Just like I said Justice is my preference to Daft Punk, Feist is my preference to someone like Cat Power, who I, I like Cat Power, but Feist is a stronger singer, I think, and a stronger songwriter. And I just was really surprised at how well this is aged. It's got some split reviews, so it's kind of interesting. All Music only gave it three and a half stars, but Pitchfork gave it an 8.8. .8. So I don't know. People were divided on this album, but if you go back and listen to it, I think it stood the test of time really, really well. Feist, The Reminder. Now, she would put out another album after this, I think called Metals or something like that, and that was good, but not quite as good, and so I had trouble keeping up with her. Her uh, releases were seemed to be subsequently weaker, but this uh, debut that she did, fantastic. The reminder, Feist. All right, number 14 is an album I used to own. I did sell it before I moved down here to Mexico. So who would make an album that would combine world music, industrial music, and avant pop? Well, that would be Bjork, someone who technically I saw in concert. I saw the Sugar Cube, so I don't know if that counts, uh, but I've never seen her since she went solo. But this is Volta. This is the album, the Red Album, with her dressed in a duck costume. Um, this is a hard listen. I didn't warm up to this album right away. I, I like Bjork, but I was like, yeah, I don't know about Volta. I kind of played this album once or twice and put it on the shelf. In revisiting it for this project, I had not listened to it in a long time. This is a great album, and the more you play it, the more you like it. It starts with Earth Intruders, which features Kanono Number 1 from uh, the Congo. <clears throat> she's got a lot of, she's got Chinese instrumentation and, you know, everything you would expect from Bjork, but this album grows on you. Now, some people didn't like it. Pitchfork said 5.8. AMG gave it four. I think it's a good album. I give it four stars. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just, I keep, every time I return to it, it gets a little bit better, gets a little bit better. You know, as you get used to the weirdness, I guess, so. Uh, it's a very eclectic album, and I I really like this one. So, is it one of her top two or three albums? No, but it's strong. And Bjork, um, I don't know if Bjork's ever really put out a bad album. Anyway, <clears throat> let me know what you think. But coming in at number 13, which would be my third woman in a row, I had Feist and Bjork. This is uh, Ricky Lee Jones. Nice picture of her here, if you can see that. I had the great pleasure to see her in concert a few years ago. And she takes a lot more risks than people realize. This is a sermon on exit sermon on Exposition Boulevard, which is a street in Los Angeles. So the story behind this is really interesting. This is the limited edition release. And it's called that because it has a, a bonus DVD. And the DVD tells you the whole story. So this was supposed to be a various artists' Christian concept album. They invited several musicians to come in and audition, see if they, you know, they were trying to decide who to use. So it was going to be a whole bunch of different singers. Ricky Lee came in. Just come on in, you know, and, and she said it was just like a, almost like just a office, didn't even look like a studio. And they had this kind of instrumental snippet. She says, oh, I like that. Can I, I have an idea. So she goes back in a room with a mic and they run that. She's just run the tape recorder and she goes back there and completely improvised lyrics on the spot, just made them up. And that's called... Uh, I believe that was Nobody Knows My Name, and she improvised two songs that day. And one of those improvisations is on this CD, exactly as recorded, so it's a little bit lo-fi. Uh, but she so stunned everyone in the room that the producer 
uh, and the one who was writing the music, he, he had to regroup and he says, look, this project has changed. It was supposed to be this. Now it's going to be this over here. And they called her back and they said, we want to do a Ricky Lee Jones album. So she wrote lyrics to the rest of the music on there. And they put this out and it's all uh, based on stories, ideas from the Bible. So there's songs on here like Donkey Ride, Road to um, Emmaus, E-M-M-A-U-S, Emmaus. I don't know how to pronounce that. Seventh Day. So you can hear there's religious uh, themes on here, Lamp of the Body. Uh, but she uh, gets them in the... But she also has songs like Falling Up and It Hurts and Elvis Cadillac. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful um, c CD. And I love this bonus DVD. I haven't watched it in a while. Unfortunately, this bonus DVD, I can't find it anywhere on YouTube or I would recommend it to you. Uh, but it's just an incredible story. She, if you watch the DVD, it, it's clear that she just like, she was tapped into the universe or something. She had some kind of muse coming down and her ability to just pour out these lyrics extemporaneously was phenomenal. And I love this. And it does take more than one listen to enjoy it. You know, I recommend three, four listens, but this will really grow on you. And uh, it's not gospel, even though it's religiously themed. It's a singer-songwriter album. But it's uh, <clears throat> 13 songs. It's wonderful. It's, uh, she's got a couple albums, two, three albums in the 21st century, really strong. And she doesn't get enough credit for the risks that she takes. Um, she's really risked her career with some very experimental things, so... I recommend the sermon on Exposition Boulevard. Coming in number 12 from Austin, Texas, a band that's been on my lists before. This is Spoon, Ga 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 Ga, five stars on All Music, eight and a half stars on Pitchfork, 84 on Metacritic, top 100 album on Rate Your Music. So this was universally praised. By everyone, 36 minutes long, so it does not overstay its welcome. And I just love the production. Uh, and Brett Daniels, one of my favorite singers. But the production is so, I don't know how they get that drum sound and that piano sound, but it's kind of claustrophobic. I just love the, I love this album sonically, in addition to the uh, tunes, the songs, the singing, the playing. There's just something about the sound of this album that's wonderful. Apparently, everybody agrees. You guys are probably already familiar with this, so I won't over-talk about it. But uh, so catchy, right? You listen to this album, and usually there's at least one song you're still humming in your head. All right, closing this list out at number 11. I've just gone through nine albums in a row. They were all recorded around 2007. But I do include anthologies, and in this case, an archival release. So even though it was recorded in 1971, it didn't come out until 2007, and that's Neil Young's Live at Massey Hall, 1971. What an American treasure he is. So this will not be on my Spotify playlist, because Neil Young has blocked his music from Spotify. Uh, but anyhow... Uh, it's a really interesting album. It's just piano, guitar, harmonica, no band. He's doing this um, show up in Canada. And he, I think Massey Hall's in Toronto, right? You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. But anyhow, he's uh, previewing a number of songs from uh, a future album. And I don't even know if he'd recorded them yet. He does Heart of Gold and Needle and Damage Done and A Man Needs a Maid and all these songs that would be on Harvest. Nobody had ever heard these. The public had never heard. And back in 71, that was not as common as it 
can be today, though if you're a really popular artist, you kind of can't do that. You kind of have to play the hits. But Neil Young does um, a couple of Buffalo Springfield songs and so forth. But about half this album is made up of tracks that nobody ever heard. And the audience is goes nuts. They go crazy for this uh, song list that he does. And that just shows his power to connect with the audience. Uh, these are wonderful songs, wonderful performance. If you watch video from around this time, he did not have any video of this performance, but you can watch BBC concert and other things around this time. You can see him just close his eyes and go off into the ether. And then he has funny uh, storytelling in between. He talks about buying a ranch and there was a ranch hand there, and this guy just kind of came with the property. He wrote Old Man about him, and that's another song he had never recorded before. So wonderful stuff. Um, all Music gives it four and a half stars. I give it four and a half stars. Pitchfork gives it an eight, which for a live album is quite incredible. Rate Your Music doesn't do live albums. All right, that's it. Richard Thompson, Grinder Man, Anushka Shankar, and Karsh Kale, The White Stripes, Justice, Feist, Bjork, Ricky Lee Jones, Spoon, and Neil Young. So I think we got a lot of countries here. We got a lot of genders here. We got a lot of genres and styles and a lot of countries. So let's see, we got England and Canada and India. Yeah, France. And we got in Iceland. Let's not forget Iceland. And let's not forget the United States either. So good stuff. I really uh, appreciate you watching. Uh, like I say, I'll have a Spotify playlist below. And uh, hit that like or subscribe button. And thanks for joining me. As we say here in Bonita, Mexico, buen dia.